Okay, welcome to the third lecture of the course. Uh, so with the last, so the first two lectures, um, we, well, we introduced thermodynamics, we introduced the energy basis, it's a special thing to look at, we did some uh, discussion on incoherent thermodynamics where we, we consider all of the, the evolving phases in the density matrix to be averaged out to zero because we do not have the presence of a reference. Um, and then, of course, we, we defined the notion of just the Gibbs state and pointed out that if you have a qubit, you can always use its populations to define a, a virtual temperature, even if, the, even if that transition is part of a larger system, which may not, not necessarily be in a Gibbs state. And the whole point about using virtual temperatures, of course, was because we could then see that when we had two different thermal states um, and maybe brought them together and looked at the joint state, we would find transitions within there which would have temperatures that were not one of the originals and, uh, importantly, could be outside the range of the originals. So that's how we would, um, in principle, make fridges and engines. More of this will come later. But all of that was, was rather about the static nature of, uh, or the static properties of states. This lecture and the next one will be focused now on something more dynamic. We're going to start talk talking about operations. And so the first operation, the simplest one we're going to talk about, is the swap and in particular, the qubit swap. And by the end of this lecture, our goal would be to understand what happens when we swap an actual qubit system that we might have on hand with a virtual qubit, so something that is part of a larger system. OK, so let me start with the general swap first. And so the question is the following. Imagine I have systems A and B, and they have the same Hilbert space. So or rather the isomorphic Hilbert spaces, so the same dimension, for example, et cetera. And I have states rho A and rho B. So I start off in a product state, rho A tends to rho B, and I want to swap the states. What is the unitary operation that I do? So I want to go to, essentially, if I write this as, um, well, okay. So for the rest of this lecture, I'm going to simplify notation, because otherwise I'll, I'll need more than one subscript. The left Hilbert space is A, the right is B. So whenever I put something in the with the tensor product, I'm not going to put the Hilbert space of the uh, of the, the index of the Hilbert space because left is always going to be one of them, right is always going to be the other. But um, but the state, for example, so if I write row one tensor row two, or row two tensor row one, this is essentially row one is on the is it, um, state oh, that's in the linear operators on Hilbert space A. Row 2 is in the linear operators on Hilbert space B. But if I write row 2 tensor row 1, it means row 2 is in the linear operators on Hilbert space of A, and so on. And the reason is because every time I swap them, I'm, I'm going to be doing this, so otherwise I'll have to write too many indices. OK, so the question is, if I have row 1 tensor row 2, and I want to go to row 2, tensor row 1, what is the unitary operation I do? So the unitary for a swap, in general, is very simple. I can describe it in terms of um, a change of basis, and it's simply this. I take the state mn, which remember is just shorthand for m tensor n, to n m for all m comma n. That's it. That's the whole unitary operation. So Remember, these are this is equivalent to saying u swap is equal to sum over m n, and I always put the one that I'm evolving as a uh, a bra, and the one I'm going to as a ket. Okay. So, in when discussing thermodynamics, it's usually um, much more convenient to describe it in this form, just as which states I'm transforming, usually because the number of states that I'm actually transforming is a small subset of all of them. So that's the usual, usually easy way. Now, if we do this, you swap on row 1 tensor row 2. This is something I'm not going to do in detail. It's easy to verify. We are going to get row 2 tensor row 1 at the end. So it is a, it's a thing that just takes two states on isomorphic Hilbert spaces and switches them. So that's the general qubit swap, uh, sorry, the general swap operation. Now, 
what is this for qubits? For qubits, it actually looks quite simple. Because notice if I take mn to nm, the only way this is not going to take a state to itself is if m and n are different. And if I have two qubits, there's only one state for which it's different. So it's basically, it's the transformation 1, 0 goes to 0, 1. And, and the same thing for 0, 1 goes to 1, 0. The 0, 0 stays the same. And 1, 1 stays the same. So if I wrote it in density matrix form, this would be 1, 1, 1, 1. Whenever I do this, it's usually the usual computational way of writing states. So 0, 0, then 0, 1, then 1, 0, then 1, 1, and so on and so forth. Yeah? Oh, sorry, dagger. Yes, yes. Thank you. Actually, yeah. Useful dagger, which is the same as strong foes in this case. Yeah. Um, very good. So, so now imagine that I have two qubits, and I do this. One of the things, actually, let me say one more thing about the general swap here. If I do this and I ask, well, how has my energy changed, for instance? So imagine that I have, um, so I have some Hamiltonian HA and some Hamiltonian HB. So of course, the, the total Hamiltonian is, is of this form, identity on A tensored HB. This is the total Hamiltonian HAB. And I ask, what is the change in average energy? So this is very easy to calculate. If uh, my initial energy, so let's write it as, well, so E average initially um, is equal to just trace of HAB times rho 1 tensor rho 2, which in turn, because HAB is just the sum, I can then split it into the sum of two things. And I am, as expected, going to get trace of HA rho 1 plus trace of hb rho 2. And the same thing now if I do E average prime. Now, this is a new uh, notation. Typically, when I just have one step and another step, a lot of times I will just use unprimed for the original quantities and primed for the changed quantities. So this is the, so this thing just means the, um, the final value. Okay, so I can do the same thing here, and it's just going to be HA with row, one, uh, row 2 plus trace of HB with row 1. And at the end, this gives me delta E average is just, oh, I'm just going to write it as uh, delta E, and unless, it's, unless there are various quantities I need to differentiate. And this is going to give me trace of uh, this minus that, so HA minus HB. Uh, another thing that I'm going to do, oh, I'm, I'm writing smaller and smaller, sorry for that. Trace of HA minus HB, row 2 minus row 1. Now, um, okay, I could say that this implicitly means that tensor identity, but maybe that's not the... Okay, now that I've written it, I'll, this is implicitly HA tensor identity B, and so on and so forth. Um, but the reason I wanted to write it in, in this fashion, so actually maybe an easier way is trace of, no, this is, this is the better way. The reason I wanted to write it in this fashion is because actually the intuitive meaning of this is, is very clear. I have an energy gradient between, between the two systems, and I have a population difference. So when I, the way I think about it, if I write row two and row one in the energy basis is, each system had some populations of being in energy levels. When I swapped them, I ended up create, creating a population difference that I moved across corresponding energy levels. And so the change in energy is just the energy gradient times the population that I added in. And this is really analogous to if I take a certain mass and I push it up in a gravitational field, I multiply the mass times the gradient of, of that field. So um, GH in that case, yeah. OK. Uh, in the case of qubits, it's going to be a much simpler form. And so let's see this. So now imagine I did this in this case here. Um, so if we have row 1, let's say, now I'm going to write it more explicitly. I'm going to say row 1 was uh, P1 
0, 0. And here I write A and B because I uh, am writing them separately. 1 minus P1, 1, 1. So it's a diagonal state. And row 2 was P2, 0, 0, A. Uh, sorry, B. Plus 1 minus P2, 1, 1 on B. This is on A. There's going to be a swap. I'm also going to say the, the Hamiltonian HA, as usual, is just EA11 one, one on A. As I said the last time, you can always shift so that, you, well, you can always shift by some amount, and typically the best way to shift is to put the ground state to zero energy, so you just have one thing less to write. Um, then, okay, as I, as I explained, row one, row two is going to become row two, row one. But what you will find then is that from this, you're going to get at the end that delta E is going to be EB minus EA times P1 minus P2. So let's see, because we have 1 minus P1 times EA be at the end. Going to do this detail. Nope, it's the opposite way. <laughs> P2 minus P1. So I do a swap. And for qubits, it's nice because I don't have to stay with the full operator expression. I just have a difference between the energies times the difference between the populations. And the reason only one population appears is because the other one, of course, is just, uh, uh, well, is completely determined by the first one. So there's only one degree of freedom. OK? Very good. Are there any questions? No? All right. So now we move on to a swap with a virtual qubit. So if you remember last, uh, last lecture, what we did is we considered the case of, let's say, two qubits like this. Take a tensor product of them. And that gave us a four-level system, out of which this one was our virtual qubit of interest. Because this was the, the inner transition, being a difference in energies, was the one where we were able to generate the temperatures that were of most interest. So now I I'm, I'm imagine that I have this scenario now. So I have a qubit system. Okay, So I, I can call it A. And I want to swap this system with something else. But this is part of a larger one. So I have a system B here. But within that system B, I only have two levels that are of interest to me. So I'm going to use, oops, there's a green for this. This is my virtual qubit. And I want to affect a swap between my real qubit and this virtual qubit. Now, one of the nice things about the swap when you write it on, on qubits, you see 1, 0 goes to 0, 1. 0, 1 goes to 1, 0. A nice way of representing that in the energy diagrams is by using these arrows. So if when 1 goes to 0 on A, then we see that 0 goes to 1 on B. And when 0 goes to 1 on A, 1 goes to 0 on B. So this, I think this was there in uh, the diagram I drew for last lecture. Now you understand what it means. I'm basically trying to write the transition 1, 0 goes to 0, 1 and the other one, 0, 1 goes to 1, 0. OK, so I want to write now the, the swap unitary for this case. Um, and what I do is, so what do I want to swap? I only want to swap in this subspace. I want to leave the rest unchanged. So in general, of course, if I was writing the whole system, I would call this state i. Oh, let me use black again, or green maybe. So I would call this state i and this state j. But because I don't really care about the rest of the system, and I can write my energies in any order I, I like, unless I require the ordering to be a certain thing, I'm just going to call this 0 and this one 1. And that will simplify my notation considerably. Um, right. So I want it to be the case that 0, 1 goes to 1, 0, the same way 1, 0 goes to 0, 1. But Anything else, so 
x on A and y on B, where y is not in the set 0 or 1, so it's any of the other states, that has to remain x, y. Okay, so these are the only ones that switch. And so this unitary is going to look like this. So when I write it in 0, 1 space, so there's going to be There's going to be a block here, which again corresponds to 0, 0, 0, 1, 1, 0, 1, 1. That is exactly the block that I wrote there, 1, 1, 0, 1. But the rest is all 1. So this is, I'm just going to write this as identity, 0, 0. OK? Um, the nice way, the, the reason also that I, uh, yeah, I put these two as 0 and 1 and separate the rest is that you see that this is now block diagonal which means that I can write this as unitary swap um, between, and now what I'm going to do is I call this virtual qubit V and R. So there's V and then the rest is R. So I'm going to write the Hilbert space of B is now a direct sum of the Hilbert space of V and the Hilbert space of R. Okay, And my unitary on the swap is a, is now, uh, I'm not going to write swap because it's always the same unitary. This is now u on a v, direct sum with identity on a r. Is a, is a notion of a direct sum uh, good for everybody, for vector spaces? I can always take two different vector spaces and join them to each other. I get direct sums of them. I can do the same thing with operators, which I've done now. And it's going to be particularly useful for us uh, when we calculate what happens uh, because of the swap. Okay, so we have that. Maybe I switch to a new board. Very good. Aha, uh -huh. and the final thing to say now is I'm going to, yes, yeah, so I'm going to write this as I, uh, the ij is 0 and 1, and I'm going to say that row b is going to be, uh, well, sorry. So let's call it Q0 with the 0, 0 on B, uh, plus Q1 with the 1, 1 on B, and plus um, rho R, which is again a density matrix or a subnormalized density matrix, but it's only on the Hilbert space R. Okay? And the other assumption is that this is, so this is block diagonal. So there is. Um, there is no zero, uh, all of the terms, zero x, for example, um, with anything here, zero x, uh, with any, any state here, let's just call it yz, or the terms one x with any state yz are all zero. So the density matrix as well, now I can write it in this form. So this is the density matrix only of B is going to be Q0, Q1, 0, there's a 0 here, there's a 0 here, 0, and then a row of R. OK? All right. So now I do the thing. Uh, have I written? So without loss of generality, I'm also going to take, well, I can write it here, never mind. So the state of the system, rho A just starts as P00 A plus uh, 1 minus P1, 1, 1 of A. And now, the thing is, because A is a real qubit, it's P1 minus P, because uh, the virtual qubit is not a completely normalized one, you have Q0 and Q1 because the sum of them is not going to be equal to 1. It's going to be less than 1. OK, so now my goal is to do the following. I do unitary on rho A tensor the full rho B, U dagger. Okay, And here's where the writing it as a direct sum comes in handy because this now, I write it in full. So I have my uh, U A V tensored uh, identity on A R. Rho A tensor rho B, I use the direct sum to write it. So I have rho A tensored rho V, I'm going to call it. 
but I'm going to put a, yeah, let me just call it row V, plus, this is a direct sum, row A tensored row R. So row V is just this, the density matrix Q0, 0, 0, Q1 that I wrote there. And then you have U dagger and the swap, uh, particularly U dagger is the same as U for, this, for the swap, but it doesn't matter. You can write it as U dagger, identity AR. Which in turn is nice because, because the, the unitary has the same direct sum decomposition as this one, we now can write this very simply. Um, on the first part, I'm going to get rho V tensored rho A. Uh, direct sum, direct sum with, aha, uh -huh. so, um, yes, so because the unitary swaps V and A, but does nothing on A and R, when we are in the space AV, it does a swap, but on the other space it does nothing, so it's row A tensor row R. Now, this is the reason why I kept the notation being left means the first system, right means the, sex, uh, the second system, because here when I say rho V tensor rho A, this is still on, oh, this is still on the, um, on A, and this is still on B, or B, well, V and B, for example, and this is, of course, on A, and this is in R, which is also in system B. Okay. All right. Any questions? Is this clear? Yes? Uh, yes, 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 yes. Sorry, give me a second. I need a slight trickiness with this. What did I do? Hold on a second. Uh, I made notes and then I did something different. Oh, it's answer V plus F. Yes, sorry. So um, let me write this. Actually, there's another step I wanted to do. So consider this. I might erase this. Just give me a second here. Um, when we have row B, did I write it there already? So it's equal to this uh, row V direct sum with rho r. What I'm going to do here is I'm going to do uh, a trick to make them all of the states normalized. So what I do is I write it as nv, and I'm going to write rho tilde v, um, with direct sum of zero operator on r, plus one minus nv, zero on v, direct sum on rho tilde of r, and what are these things? So what I've done is I've taken nv is equal to q0 plus q1. So this is actually the same as what I discussed in the last lecture. nv is the norm of the virtual cube. It's the probability that you're in the subspace. And so rho tilde v is, the, is, a normalized, um, is now a normalized qubit. So it's q0 divided by q0 plus q1, and q1 divided by q0 plus q1. OK? And the same way, of course, 1 minus nv is is 1 minus this, q0 minus q1, which, because the whole state is normalized, has to be trace of rho r. So it has to be trace of what's remaining, because the whole thing together sums up to 1. So of course, rho r tilde is now rho r divided by trace of rho r, which once again is a normalized state. So these two are now normalized states. So what I've, I've basically split it as, with nv probability, you are in this normalized density matrix, and with 1 minus nv, you are in that normalized density matrix, OK? And that is actually the state I want to do in input here. I went one step too quickly. Um, so that's the state. Sorry for the mix-up. So it is nv rho tilde v direct sum with or plus 1 minus nv um, 0 v direct sum with sorry, or. OK, very good. And now I act with this on each, each thing in turn. So in the first case here, because now this is just a, is a sum of two operators and un, the unitary action is linear, 
So in the first case here, when I do the U swap on on just this state, I, I yes. Now you're missing the, the, the oh yeah, sorry, I ran out of space. Row A tends to this and row A tends to that. Is this clear? Because I w otherwise I have to erase this and write it all in another line. Each of this is row A tensored this thing and row A tensored that thing. Sorry. So when I do, so let me, because that's confusing, let me do it for the first term in detail. So if I do it on the first term, what I'm doing is this operation, row A tensored the state row V tilde direct sum with zero on the R space and U A V dagger tensored, uh, sorry, you, this is not, this is direct sums, sorry. Direct sum with identity on AR. Okay, and this is particularly simple because this is now just a, this is, um, ah. in each space you have the different blocks are so completely independent. In the AV block, you have the unitary swap acting on a, Rho A tensored, a, a basically a normalized density matrix, and of course the UAV dagger, whereas on the, the rest of the state you have identity operation acting on an empty state because it's actually the zero operator with identity. So then you simply get Rho tilde V tensored, Rho A, and then you have a direct sum of basically zero on the AR space, where I combine the AR space here. Okay, so this is just this term here. And so let me put this in a little bit of a bracket. This is just to explain what happens to each term. And so now I continue that calculation. What I'm going to have is the first term, the NV is just a constant. In that case, I have the swap. So I have my state here that I've just written. Rho tilde V, um, tensor rho A, direct sum with zero AR. And then the other term, I do in an analysis way, are getting harder. Um, the other time I do in an analogous way, there I have actually nothing in the AV subspace because rho A tensor zero V in the AV subspace is just zero operator. So the swap is acting on a, a null state. And in the other subspace on AR, it's just identity, so it leaves it the same. So the other term now becomes zero on the AV subspace tensored, uh, sorry, direct sum with what's on the AR subspace in the beginning, because that is, that's acted upon by identity, and that was rho A tensored rho R tilde. Okay, so what do I have? Just to recap, with probability NV, I was actually in the virtual qubit subspace, and I did the full swap as we did last time. With probability one minus NV, I was actually, my, my system V was not in the virtual qubit subspace, and so there, no swap happened. You were just in the state rho R, which is not touched by the unitary. Okay, so the, the reason I went through the direct sum way of writing this is particularly to get this clean convex combination of the case where you did a, a normal swap and the case where you did nothing. Uh, this is slightly different to how I did the previous years. In previous years, I actually just did the whole indexing and did the whole operation. Um, so in the lecture notes, that one is presented, and you can go back and compare to sort of get comfortable both ways. But this way is particularly simple because now I already have the end result that I'm looking for, um, which is that in some cases I have V, in some cases I do not. So the most important question for us is, what is the final state of A? The final state of A, which is of course trace over B of the final state of, I would call it rho AB prime. So whenever I write this, it means the joint state of A and B, and prime means the final state. Okay, so it's trace of this one here. Okay, and I can do this now because there's a, lean, there's a sum here. I do the trace of each thing in turn. So when I do the trace uh, of this one, NV is just on the outside, and the trace of rho V tilde tensor rho A. So just to be clear, I could expand this. Oh, there's a green one. This zero on A and R, I could write it as, um, let me write it here. This is also zero A tensor zero R. That's the same thing. And so now when I, um, in my VA space, when I trace, I'm just tracing rho A. And in that space, I'm tracing over zero, so I get nothing. So here, I'm just going to get NV, NV tilde. 
Yes? In the box, uh, I did just this part. So I did just uh, this, this term. So there were two terms in here, and I sandwiched them in the unitary, both of the terms. And just in the box, I did the first term in, in, uh, in detail. So of course, I have an NV multiplying here, but I, I wanted to just look at how this one transforms. Rho A tensor, rho V, direct sum, rho R. Uh, this one here, uh huh. Uh, so that that was because I have. Uh, let me. Okay, maybe I I do this one step further. I just do it in, let's say, in matrix form here. So basically, this is I'm writing now that expression in matrix form. So this is my U swap, and this is identity on A R. So I'll be correct. It is U A V. Then I multiply by this density matrix. The density matrix being. With respect to the same blocks, I have rho A tensor rho V tilde, and here I have a zero on R, and then I have my thing again, the same one. So U swap dagger and zero, uh, sorry, identity on AR. Okay. Yeah. So now, I mean, now when you do matrix multiplication and you have that just, this is one block, this is another block, this is another block, it means that you can just do the block multiplication by itself, and that would be fine. So in this case here, I'm going to get that in the top block there, I'm going to get UAV times this. So, oh, sorry, there's UAV. So UAV rho A tensor rho V tilde UAV dagger. And in the block at the bottom, I get identity AR, zero R, identity AR, which is just zero. Oh, this is AR. Zero AR because, I mean, I have a zero operator, so whatever I multiply with it is still zero. Yeah. So, and, and, then, and then, of course, this one, this is the, the normal swap that we did the last time, so that just leads to a, a switch in V and A and the direct sum with OR. Yeah. Yeah. You're welcome. Um, yes, sorry, it's with, with the direct sums, it's, it can be a bit quick. But the easiest way is to indeed think of it as because you have now completely independent blocks, every multiplication is just blockwise multiplication, and then you put them together at the end. Um, yes? Yes? Ah, because this comes about because it was zero. It was row A tensor zero. So this, this is because this term came from the before the unitary was acting. It was row A tensored zero V direct sum with row R, which in turn was zero A V direct sum row A tensored row R. Uh, so the so the zero under the need, I mean under the swap operation just remains zero. Okay. Yeah. So uh, I mean okay. Let me. Which system is this? Because we're using A to label. Yeah. Also no, I, that's the point. I'm not. I'm. I'm only using uh, the indices to label the state rather than the Hilbert space. That's why, yeah, so whenever I write. Yes. Ah. Yes, OK, so I should just write it as 0. Yes, no, you're, you're right. Yeah. The the you uh, are the identity. You mean the the identity that was part of the. Well, the identity term just left what we had the same. That's what I basically did.
Yes. Okay. So I think I. Well, I think I think the the lesson I've learned is that trying to reduce the notation by the strict has not worked because in the end I still want to write this to be zero on A and R. So that was a mistake, and and possibly when I I add I would add this to lecture notes and make it a bit clearer. Um, but yes. So but to be complete, let me write down the other one as well just so that it's, it's clear. In the other case, again, I have the same unitary. Uh, I don't need that much of space, so write it smaller. I still have u. I still have identity. But the other state is the one with 0 and the thing there. So it's a 0 here, and it's row a tensored row r. And then I have, again, the unitary dagger, so u dagger and identity there. And indeed, now, when I write this out in full, and again, I do blockwise multiplication, I'm just going to end up with a 0 in the top block, and in the bottom, I end up with the same state that I started with. So independently of the mix-up with the indices and the notation. Yeah. So indeed, this is, I shouldn't have put, the, given that I put the, I said that the, the order is of the Hilbert space is is the systems, I didn't need to put um, indices on the operators. I shouldn't have put indices on. So ignore all of the indices on the operators, basically, because they, are, they should be clear from the system that they're acting on. All right. Yes. We started at 9.45. OK, so let me complete this, and then we have a break. Um, yes, yeah, so I was taking the trace of the final system. So at least I hope at the end uh, the final system is clear. In one case, yeah, we have. V and A, uh, and they were swapped. In the other case, we have um, A with R, which is not swapped. And when I take the trace over this, on this case, I will get NV till the V. And in the other case, with 1 minus NV, I'm going to simply get rho A. So let me put it this way. Let me write this matrix as well so that it becomes clear what I did with the trace. Oof. So the final state of row A, B prime, this is equal to, so in this block we switched, so it's row V tilde tensor row A with a NV. And in this block we didn't switch, so it's 1 minus NV, and it's row A tensor row R tilde, okay? So when we trace over system B, so we're we are tracing over the second part in each block, in this case here, so this one here is going to lead to NV rho V tilde, and this one here is going to lead to 1 minus NV rho A, because rho R tilde is a normalized version of A. Okay? Now, this is actually kind of almost obvious once, you, once we had this manner in which we wrote the final state, because what we have is that, well, with NV we did the swap, with 1 minus NV we didn't do the swap, so of course at the end this, the final state of A looks like with NV we got um, a real swap with a, a normalized virtual qubit, but with 1 minus NV us, our state didn't change and we just back to the original state. Okay, um, then in that case I will take a break here and let's continue at 10.35. Yes. So in this thing here, like if I enter this to zero, I get this. Yes, okay. indeed. Yeah, yeah. So if I take the, yes, because the, I mean, this follows from the definition of the, the tensor thing. So if I have like the tensor product of vectors, right? So if I have alpha v tensor beta uh, w, then this is, when I write it down as a full vector, this is alpha, beta, v, tensor, w. Mm -hmm. So the coefficients just multiply. So if one of them is 0, ah, okay. you end up with 0. Really yes, like, like proper 0, yeah. Like you mean here, yeah. 
So indeed, when, so when you, whenever you take an operator and you tensor product it with a zero operator, you're going to get zero because you will element-wise end up multiplying and you always multiply by zero. Yeah. Yes? Mm -hmm. Ah, the mic, yes, that's true. When I start speaking, I go louder, so. Okay, how is it now? This is, that's good? Okay, yeah. Mm -hmm. Yes, yeah. yes, indeed. Um, so this comes from two things. So for example, for we already know that the, the total state, I assume, is positive semi-definite because it's the state of a system. But once we have that, and then you add the fact that it's block diagonal, so there's no coherences between them, then it follows that each block has to be positive semi-definite. And the reason for this is, if I have a matrix that is block diagonal, um, then the eigenvalues of the matrix, when I find them, will be the eigenvalues of each block because I, I basically have each block is like an independent thing that contributes to the eigenvalues and eigenvectors of the matrix. So if I know that my total matrix is positive semi-definite and I have a number of blocks, that means each one of, so positive semi-definite means all of the eigenvalues are greater or equal to zero. So each block must therefore have eigenvalues that are greater or equal to zero, which in turn implies that each block is positive semi-definite. Yeah. The only difference is that each block is not normalized to one because they are subparts. Yeah. Yes? Yes, we, we are recording the tutorial. So we, um, we will s later this afternoon upload from last week and this week the lectures and the, and the tutorials, yes. So this is assuming that all of the recording has worked because on the Wednesdays the recording is, uh, is handled by the internal system of ETH, so it automatically records. We will put the upload and... Uh, yeah. Yes, indeed. Yes, yeah, so that also applies to... Um, the lecture. So, for example, this lecture, the presentation of this, I essentially the previous years I, I just stayed with the full matrix with the, the different vectors, and I showed how each of the elements of the joint matrix changes. But of course, at the end, my goal is to get that the final state of A is just this convex combination, and for that reason, this year I changed to working with the direct sum, which I think requires a bit more um, work to make it formally without any little mistakes and confusions. So in case you would like to go and, and see that second lecture to see the other way, you could do that as well. All right. Check, check. Yes. OK, it's back. Um, yes, so just to come back to that and, and uh, introduce the formal way of doing it, but I'm not going to do all the calculations again. What I meant was I have a Hilbert space that's HA tensored HB, and HB I split as a direct sum of my virtual qubit that I'm swapping with, and the rest, which is just all of the rest. I also have, and now in, just for this particular section, I actually have the, the states um, described by indices at the bottom, which are just numbers, uh, or something else, it's called a star, and um, the Hilbert space denoted by the, sub, the superscript in brackets. So I had a state on A, which was the first state, and the state on B, which is the second state, and the second state was able to be split as some NV times some state tau on the V space, direct sum with one minus NV, some state three on the R space, and my unitary was the unitary swap on the AV space, this is a tensor product space, direct sum with identity on the AR space. And now, if you do the unitary that I just described on this, then you will get at the end, without going through all of the steps, so you, row 1, A, tensor, row 2 on B, U dagger is going to give you the state that I described. So that's going to be, so with probability NV, you get tau, but this is now on state A, tensored row 1 on state V, and with 1 minus NV, you get row 1, uh, so, no, 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 I still have to complete the space. So it's, yeah, it's tau a tensored 
yeah, row 1 on V, direct sum 0 on R, plus 1 minus NV, A stays the same. And on the other one, you have 0 on V, direct, oops, nope, V, direct sum row 3 on R. Okay, so you start from here with this state, which you can split, and this unitary, that's the final state you will get, which then, of course, we can take the trace again, and, and we will get the same answer, so at the end, in this case here, but just with the difference that I've labeled it here as row 1 and, and tau. Okay. So perhaps I will continue with that, in fact. Now, well, once we reach that state, I, I'm not going to need the, the, the double Hilbert space anymore. Okay. Um, any questions? Is the question you were asking clear about the swap and the entanglement and stuff? That was okay? All right. So, now, um, I wanted to briefly mention something uh, that turned up. So, during this calculation, what I defined was the... Um, so, in the space of B, I, I took the two subspaces and I defined sort of the normalized versions of them with this tilde, so this row tilde of V, which is the normalized state of a virtual qubit. And why is this important for us? So, now, I'm going to continue on this side. So imagine that I have a virtual um, virtual qubit state. So this, I described it as Q0, 0, 0, Q1. And then I normalize it. I'm going to get the state Q0 upon Q0 plus Q1, 0, 0, Q1 upon Q0 plus Q1. Okay? Now, they look like different states, but one thing, and the most important thing, remains the same, the Gibbs ratio. The Gibbs ratio, remember, is the, is the ratio of the elements rho 1, 1 and rho 0, 0, if I write it as a diagonal element, which in both cases is Q1 by Q0, because in the second case, they just both gain the factor. So the important thing with the normalized state of the virtual qubit is that the temperature properties, which are described with the Gibbs ratio, they remain the same. And so what we see, therefore, in this calculation is that with some probability, my state of A has gone to the normalized state of the virtual qubit, which is the one, which is basically the state that has the temperature that I put on that virtual qubit, and with 1 minus nV, nothing happened. And this is important because that diagram is no longer there. When we generated this dual system here, where this was our virtual qubit, what we calculated last time is we could generate whatever virtual temperature we wanted by, say, choosing the energies and stuff. But what we cannot do in this case is make this normalization 1. So we can generate the temperature properties of that transition, but it's always going to be a sub-normalized qubit because there's always going to be probability in the ground and the excited state. The ground state specifically, because this is a lower energy state than these two, so it's going to have even more population than either of these, meaning that this one always has a smaller population than one. But that's not a problem because in each swap, it's not like we go towards some weird state that is a juxtaposition of having a different norm and temperature. No, we go towards the state as if this was a real qubit with the temperature that we assigned, it's just that the probability of doing so is less than 1. Okay? So that's about the normalized virtual qubit. And now, now I consider the following. When, it have, when we had two real qubits that we swapped, the state of my, let's say, the first one, which is my system of interest, became the, the state of the second one. That's fine. In this case here, it doesn't do so. Only with some probability it happens, but with some probability it sort of fails. So as a, as a process of like transforming the state, I have some probability of failure. So how do I get this to, to go closer? Naively, I cannot simply repeat this unitary operation. So imagine that I took my final state that I got at the end of doing the swap, and then I just repeated the same swap again. Does anybody want to just volunteer an answer as to what would happen? Exactly. I would swap back because the, one of the most important properties of the, unitary, uh, the swap unitary is that u swap squared is identity. So it's, well, it's basically the, it's proportional to the sigma y matrix, so you can see that. Um, yeah, so if I perform the same operation again on the final state, I will simply go back to my initial state. So what I have to do if I want to repeat the operation, so if I want to repeat the swap, I have to reset B first. Okay. So I have to somehow 
reset B to the properties that I want, and then I'll be able to repeat the swap. Now, what does a reset mean? So the first thing we can consider is just the reset channel, which is just when I take, so the reset channel is defined by, let's say I, I call it M with some tau. Acting on any state rho is just equal to tau. That's the definition of the reset channel. Did you do a, any sort of reset channel or state preparation in, Q, in the QIT course? OK, so then just, just to sort of prove that it is a valid channel, because as I've written it now, it's just a transformation. But to prove that it's a CPTP channel, well, it's, it's quite simple. So imagine the first, uh, the simple case. Imagine that I want a reset channel. So reset to a pure state, let's call it psi. Then what do I do? I construct the following Krauss operator. So I take a k to be equal to um, psi v k, where v k is an orthonormal basis. Normal basis. Doesn't matter which basis, can be any basis. Okay. So if I do this, then what I end up doing is that, so now I'd consider the channel, sum over a, uh, k, a, k, rho, a, k, dagger, is going to give me sum over k of psi, and then I'm going to have v, k, uh, rho, v, k, psi. And the point is that when I sum over this, this in intermediate thing now here, well, I can simplify this further, psi is independent of this, so I just have sum over k, v, k, rho vk, and then the cat psi again. This is just trace of psi. It's the sum of the diagonal elements in that basis. So that's always 1, and I end up with psi psi, which is exactly what I wanted. So you see, therefore, that this is now a valid channel. I've written it as a sum of cross operators. And OK, the other thing to show that it's a valid channel is that sum over k, ak dagger, ak, is going to be equal to sum over k of vk psi psi vk, which is, of course, sum over k of just vk vk, which is the identity, because vk is an orthonormal basis, so that's just the spectral decomposition of the identity. So it's a, it's a valid channel. And now, to now consider if I want to reset, if I want to reset to, um, reset to a, another state, let's call it eta, and all I have to do is I just decompose eta in its diagonal basis. So I just say this is now sum over, let's call it, I uh, don't want to use P, Q, C. Let's call it CR, um, psi R, psi R over R. And now I construct the reset channels for each psi R in turn. But then I just take a mixture of them. So in this case here, I would take A, R, K to be equal to psi r v k, but then I simply, I think I have to multiply it by, yeah, I multiply it by square root of cr. And now I have, a, I have a full set with respect to r as well as to k, and I do the same thing. The reason I multiply by square root of r is because then when I take a k rho a k dagger, the square root will go away, and I just get, with cr, I get a property of that channel, which will take me to that psi r, and then the mixture of all of them is going to give me the full channel. So all of this is to say, that the channel that takes you from any state to one particular state is a valid CPTP map. It's a valid channel. It's normalized. It has a cross operator decomposition. OK. Um, now, so that's for one. I can also do the same thing when I have multiple systems. So um, the natural question now comes, because this is actually relevant to us. What if we have a joint state rho a, b? So we have this, and we want to reset b. So I'm not, a, I'm not going to go through the whole Krauss operator decomposition and stuff of this. But the natural way of doing this is to consider what you do physically. So I have two systems. They are in a joint state that could have correlations and entanglement. And so what I do to reset the state of b is I simply, either I can do it in two ways. I either take away the system b and I replace it with another identical system, the same isomorphic Hilbert space and stuff, which has the state that I want. So I've reset it. 
or I have a process that actually takes the same system and resets it. But it's nicer to think about it as replacing it with a fresh copy because then it becomes very clear what I want to do. So I have row A, B. And the first thing I do is I just take away, I throw away the system B. So I take the trace over B of row AB. So this is throw, throw away B, and then bring a fresh copy. So bring fresh uh, B along, and that will now tensor whatever I had, which is trace over B of row AB, tensor whatever state I want, and assume the state that I want is tau, so it's tensor tau on B. Okay, so this is now the reset channel on this. So I would call it so M tau um, on like acting on B, which acts on row AB. Is just you trace over row AB, and then you tensor tau back in. Trace over B of row AB. So that's the general reset channel. OK, so oh man, there's a problem with this. Either there's a problem with this, or I'm significantly weaker than last year, but I think it's a problem. Um, yes, so any questions? Is it OK? Yeah? Yes. So it, 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 if, if this was an unknown state, then quantum cloning, you could not copy it many times. But if this is a state, this is a known state that we just want to keep preparing. So, so think of it more as there is a particular state that we know, which is good for the initial operation. So we prepare many copies of that. Then we operate it, but now the B is no longer useful. So you throw it away, you bring the next one. So indeed, it's, it's a, so the answer is it's a known state, this tau B. It's not an unknown state, yeah. So and in our case, it's basically a thermal state, or it's the, you know, it's the, vir the state of the virtual qubit that we prepare. OK, so now we are ready. So consider now the rep repeated swaps. Repeated swaps with, of course, with resets. So what are we doing? So basically, we had row A, uh, yes, row A, tensored. And I'm going to write this as now, oof, yeah. Let me switch. So it's NV. So I'm going to call this row tilde V that I had previously in the notes. I'm just going to call it tau because it's a, it's basically the normalized state and it's it's a thermal state of a qubit essentially that we we want our state A to go to. So this is like tau. Um, yes, and of course we had the direct sum with one minus NV of the rest, some row tilde R. Okay, and we did the swap. And so that ended up with some state of row A, B prime. And it was such that row A prime alone was equal to NV tau plus 1 minus NV, the original state. OK? So now imagine that I do a swap. I reset my state B so that it has the same structure again. And then I do the swap again. What am I going to get? Well. What we would not like to do is to do the entire calculation again. And we do not have to do it. And the reason is because of the following. One of the nice ways of um, interpreting this statement here, or rewriting it, oh. so let me rewrite it here. So rho a prime is equal to nv tau plus 1 minus nv rho a. I can just subtract tau on both sides, and I have rho a prime minus tau is equal to uh, minus tau, so it's nv minus 1. So I'm going to get 1 minus nv rho a minus tau. OK, so I subtract tau on the side, I subtract tau on the side. That's going to give me an nv minus 1 instead of a 1 minus nv. I take it common, and I get that. OK, and so this is nice, because this is sort of the final difference, and this is the initial difference. So a very simple way of seeing it is that I have some distance between, or actual, actual difference between the state of my system and the state I want it to go to. And in the end, the state of my system, the, the, the difference at the end is going to decrease, because 1 minus nv, of course, is a number between 0 and 1. 
And you also see the limits. If NV is one, which means my virtual qubit was actually a real qubit, was ev the, the system B was entirely in the, in the qubit subspace of interest, then this would be zero, which means that this difference would be zero, my row away prime was equal to tau. So if I have a full qubit, I do it in one swap, it's done. The closer NV becomes to, goes to zero, then the slower this process becomes. Okay, so then using this now, I can easily get what happens in the second time because now I can say, imagine that I do it two times. So I say row A after the second step minus tau. It's going to be exactly the same thing, one minus NV because I repeat the same swap times the initial difference. But the initial difference on the second step is what I had after the first step. So rho A minus tau, A prime minus tau. So in my, my initial state for the second step is, of course, the final state from the first step, which is rho A prime, so I get this. And now if I continue doing this, well, actually, I can already simplify this. Rho A prime minus tau itself is given by 1 minus NV that. So this is 1 minus NV squared times rho A initial minus tau. And so if I continue doing so, I'm going to get that if I repeat this n times, and when I say repeat, I mean swap, reset, swap, reset, I'm going to get 1 minus NV to the power n of my initial difference. Yes, which this one, of course, always goes to 0 as n goes to infinity, as long as, so if nv is greater than 0. So this is nice. So I can have a virtual qubit that's part of a larger system. And my virtual qubit might have a temperature that I like, but actually a very bad probability of being there. So it's actually very subnormalized, a very small possibility that I'm actually in the subspace that I need. But it doesn't matter. If I repeat it enough times, 1 minus nv, this is always a number between 0 and 1. And this to the power n is always going to go to 0 as n goes to infinity, as long as nv is not actually 0. Because if nv is 0, then of course, nothing ever happens. OK? Is there any question? Yes? Yes? Yes. Yes, exactly. And can you trace all the differences? Yes. Or is it by tracing all the differences, you can actually in a separate supervised or a separate virtual uh, reset process? Yes. And we've been doing it basically with computer uh, systems that we use, which is like, like, a, like a bar or a bar. We were just interested in the average data difference. And that's yes. Yes. So this is a good question. So let's let let's put it this way. So if if I had a if I had a full state, I think the, this the thing that you said was pretty much spot on. So if I have a state row a, and I want it to be tau, so row a has to go to tau, then the easiest way would just be to swap row a tensor tau. Okay. But the problem in thermo is that. If, so imagine, so I, in, in, so I have a, basically a thermo setup, and I have a, a beta cold, or let's, well, let's say beta cold and beta hot. Sometimes I call the cold room or cold, depending on the setup. But it's basically two temperatures that I have access to, beta cold and beta hot. Of course, beta cold is greater than beta hot, meaning that this is colder than that one. OK, so with such a thing, I, can, I cannot generate um, a qubit, a full qubit that has a temperature outside this range. So I, have, I can generate any thermal state. So this means I can get any thermal state e to the um, minus beta c h here. This means I can get anything of the form e to the minus beta h h for any, like, so for all h, I have these available. But I, if I want something where, let's say, a beta v that is greater than beta c, so there's something even colder than c, then I can't generate it by just using these two temperatures together uh, in a, on, on a full state of a qubit. What I can do is what I described the last time. I can find a transition in a joint state, and this one has the temperature beta v, so which is greater than beta c. So now the thing is, OK, I can generate this transition. 
and I can swap this transition with my system. But the problem, of course, is now it's not going to go to tau. It's going to go to a mixture of tau and itself. So I need to now repeat the process to get it closer and closer to tau. And the way I repeat the process is, so one of the things we will eventually go when we do thermal machines is, I had, I had a manner of generating, so in the case of the qubits, for example, when I had two qubits, the way I would generate the, the transition of interest is that I would connect one of them to a temperature Tc and connect the other one to a temperature Th. And that would give me my virtual qubit with the temperature that I constructed. So what I do basically between the unitary swap, I basically reconnect it to the temperatures so that they thermalize again and my, my state is being reset to what, what I want it to. So that was the part in the schematic as you were saying. So the, the part is that B is essentially something that is being engineered by the reservoirs. And we have to keep the engineering process going on because in between swaps, our, our B, our basically our machine has gotten in a sense, degraded by the system, so it has to be reset to its desired state, and then we can use it again. Yeah. So that's essentially why. Yeah, and, and the main point is the reason we require this is because we cannot get full states that are thermal with temperatures that are outside our range. What we can get is sub subspaces that are engineered to what we like. Okay, uh, what do I do here? So we have the U neutral. Very good. So now, the only thing that remains to discuss, but this is actually a very simple discussion, is what is the energy cost of doing this? So imagine I, I did it once, I did it two times, and like I'm, I'm going to have an energy cost associated with this. Now, what do I mean by energy cost? So when I say energy cost here, I'm going to define it as difference in... Average energy. So final minus initial. Okay, so this is, I've already written down the expression for this is delta E that I wrote down before. And what I'm going to consider is that that's the energy cost. And the, and the reason is because if I take now a step back and I say, well, what was I doing in this? I had two systems and I applied a unitary operation on the systems. Well, the point is that the unitary operation has to be done by some, well, some physical process. And of course, we know that globally energy is conserved. So if at the end, my two systems have changed in average energy, that means whatever machinery did the unitary operation must have provided or taken away that average energy. So in, in, in particular, if the energy of my system has increased, so, or the energy of the joint system, the two things that I was acting on, that means whatever machinery was involved must have had to supply the energy. So we keep track of the energy cost by keeping track of the difference in average energy of the um, initial and final states of the whole setup. Okay? So, what is the energy cost? So now, oh, I'm missing Y there. So remember I wrote delta E as, indeed, there was a trace of H, um, let's write it now as, let's write it in full. So H A plus identity B minus H B tensor identity A. And then acting on rho 2 minus rho 1. So this is the transformation that rho 1 tensor rho 2. And I'm, I have given up on hiding the subscripts because I think that creates confusion. So it's rho 1 on A, rho 2 on B, goes to rho 2 on A tensor rho 1 on, on B. And if you just calculate the initial and final energy, this is what you get. OK. so. Let's go to the next one.
So, okay, so when we did the simple qubit swap, so imagine now the case where I just had row one tensored tau, so both real qubits. And I swapped it so it became tau tensored row one. Then we knew in this case that delta E was just um, trace of, let's call it H, oh, sorry, H A, so H, H A tensored identity plus identity, oh, minus identity tensored H of B times tau minus rho one. So that was in the case of real qubits. So now what happens when we do this whole process? So one of the things that we will use is, okay, the first thing is the energy is additive, so we're still considering the systems are not interacting, so the Hamiltonians is just the sum of the Hamiltonians. So we have that, let's see, so row A was just, let's call it row one, to be simple, and row B was this tau, so row one A, so row of A, row of B, was this tau on V, direct sum, well, this is NV, direct sum um, one minus NV on, let's call this row three, just to be consistent with what I've written before, R, okay, which it's actually more useful to write it in this form, NV tau V uh, direct sum zero on R plus one minus NV zero on V direct sum rho three on R. These are the same things. Okay, and at the end, we had rho A, B, so let's say rho prime of the whole thing, so A and B, was equal to with NV, we just had it in this subspace, and so we had tau now on A, tensored rho one on V plus zero on R, and the other term one minus NV, in this case it was just rho A, so rho one on A, tensored zero on V plus rho three on R. Okay, so What's the final energy? Let's see, the, the final energy of this whole thing. And I'm now just going to do it piece by piece. So with this one here, now because we have the same direct sum structure, I can also now split my H of B is also the same. Yes, yeah? so it's H, the part of the Hamiltonian that's in that block, direct sum with the part of the Hamiltonian that's in the R block. Okay, so that's also the same. So I act with the Hamiltonian here. Um, what, am I, what am I going to get? The energy is linear, so I'm going to get trace of H A tau acting on A plus trace of H V row one acting on V. And this is all multiplied by an N V. And in the case one minus NV, I'm going to have trace of HA acting on row one A plus trace of HR acting on row three R. And this was with the one minus NV. So that's E average prime and E average. What is E average? Here I don't have to consider the joint state because it's, it's a product state. So E average is just the energy of A, which is trace of H A, oh, sorry, H A rho one on A, plus, and on the other side I have trace of H V tau V, plus trace of H R rho R. That was my initial energy. And so now, what is my delta E? So I subtract. Uh, 
Uh, yeah. So I subtract this one from that one. Oh, sorry. I subtract the, this one from this one. And I'm going to get now also the same. So with NV minus 1, I'm going to get the trace of HA row 1A. So that takes care of the first term and the second term with also this. Uh, oh, no, no. Uh, no, 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 sorry. That was the first term and this term and, yeah, sorry. So I have NV minus 1. So NV, I'm going to write this, okay, trace of HA times tau A minus ooh, row 1 of A. Okay. So I've taken this term, and I've subtracted NV of this. So of course, I still have uh, 1 minus NV part remaining here of trace of HA row 1A. OK, so that takes care of the first two terms. I do the similar thing in the next one. So I say NV trace of HV times row 1V minus tau acting on v, the same way. But again, here I've taken, so I have the nv term, but I've taken only nv from here. So I have to add 1 minus nv, subtract 1 minus nv, <laughs> trace of hv row 1v, that's that. Then I have plus 1 minus nv, so. 1 minus NV trace of H. That, yeah, sorry, that's a tau. Thank you. Yeah, this is the reason why I also didn't like putting all of the indices, but yeah, there seems no way around it. Um, yes, 1 minus NV, thank you for correction. Row 1A. So that's that term here. And then we have plus, so these two terms now I can combine. So plus 1 minus NV minus 1 of that. So it's just minus NV of trace of H of R, oh, row 3 of R. So much more messy with all of the indices. Okay. So um, why am I doing all this? My goal is basically to write this uh, in a form where you see that it's actually related to this one, but again with the 1 minus NV in there. So let's consider the terms. So E average is that. And E average prime is yes. this minus that. Okay. So this is equal to are the terms are any terms common in here? Yes. So I combine these two terms, and I will get NV times trace of, well, I want to combine these two terms, but without messing up the indices. So okay, let's do it in this manner, HA tensor identity V minus H minus identity A tensor HV. And this is tau, basically tau minus rho. Well, this is this is now this is the problem with indices. So what I want to point out is the following: this is trace of the Hamiltonian acting on A, so one operator acting on a difference between tau and rho one, and this is a different Hamiltonian acting on negative of the difference. So ideally, what I would like to write it as, and this is the question is whether it's clear enough or not. 
is I want to write these two terms as the following. So it's just NV times trace of H, basically HA minus HV, but just as operators now, not as, um, as with the different Hilbert spaces, times tau minus rho 1. Because they are, they are operators of the same size because, of course, the um, A and V are both qubits. Okay? So that's, that's the difference in NGs. But it's multiplied by NV. So it's, it's essentially what we got here. H, when we had the full swap where rho 1 tensor tau just went to tau rho 1. But as expected, it has a probability of occurring, so it's the NV probability. OK. Um, yes. And the other terms, first thing I notice is this cancels with that one. So that's completely fine. And I have, so then I have, I think I have made a mistake because I should get, I should get plus 1 minus NV 0, but I am not getting that. Uh, what happened? Ah, yes. So, um, indeed, what I forgot to add, so when I wrote E average in the initial time, this is a normalized state, but these were not normalized. So th this, this had to be multiplied, this term had to be multiplied by an NV, and this term had to be multiplied by a 1 minus NV. I apologize, because the state, the state of B, remember, is NV tau V plus 1 minus NV rho 3. So when we take the energies, is the average energy of this state multiplied by NV, average energy of that state multiplied by 1 minus NV. So that was the problem which is why a lot of the things. So this, this combination with this one would give me what I wanted in the beginning. Um, NV with that one would give me this, and then I would no longer need, I would no longer need this correction because the multiplying term is both NV there and NV there. And finally, so 1 minus NV H rho would still be give, given by that. Yes, it would also be. So the only term that would change then is that 1 minus NV with the rho R um, HR would cancel exactly with that one. So this is not even there. So that's OK. Sorry about that. Um, indeed, so we actually just have this. So delta is equal to this. And I mean, I can, if I like, just write times 1 minus NV times 0. This is just adding a 0. And the reason I do it in this fashion is, again, it's the same thing. It's NV times delta E of a swap, so the, the, the full swap, basically, and plus 1 minus NV delta E of, well, no swap, which means that, of course, the states remain the same. So again, the same thing. I mean, this also follows from the fact that the Hamiltonian is linear. Um, so if I have that the state is a linear combination of two things, then the Hamilton is also going to be a linear combination, or the energies are going to be a linear combination of the same. So my delta E also changes in exactly the same way. OK, so this also means that I can write now delta E minus, I would call this delta E of a full swap, is exactly 1 minus NV of delta E minus delta E of the swap, uh, sorry, is NV minus 1. That which is equal to that. Okay. What is the goal of all of this? That's something. Um, the goal of this was to say so. Actually, uh, this is also because I did everything in direct sum is different from how I did in the last lecture. So, remember when I wrote down the first uh, equation for the energy, I said, well, you can consider that 
the only thing that happens when you do a swap is you push a population difference up a certain gradient. So the only thing that happens when we do what I would call a partial swap, where we swap sometimes and we don't swap the other times, is with the same probability, you push the, um, a particular population up an energy gradient, and with some probability, you fail. So when we consider what happens when we do the repeated steps, the actual thing we need to do is we, we do not need to actually convolute each step and calculate the energy difference individually. All we need to consider is the fact that, well, in each step, I take the population difference times the energy gradient. The energy gradient remains the same step over step. So at the end, if I repeat this n times, all I have to do is add up the population differences from the beginning to the end and calculate the same thing. So what I am trying to say, which perhaps we could have gotten there without having to go through the whole thing, is if I go now from row, let's say row um, A to row A1 to row A2, for example, in this process of the repeated swaps, What I'm going to find is that my delta E, let's call it delta E, uh, so after, after n steps, is going to be equal to, of course, by definition, it's the sum over n delta E from, so let's say, from n minus 1 to n. But this, when I calculate it in full, is going to simply be um, given by, let's put it on the next line, the trace of, again, I have H A, well, yeah, H A tensor identity on V minus at identity on V tensor H A times the final state rho n of a minus rho, uh, or rather, actually, ooh, yeah, uh, yes, rho n of a minus tau. Okay, and and the reason is because well, in each of this, in each of the steps, uh, as you go, if you calculate delta e individually, you'll get of course the same energy gradient, but in each step, it's going to involve rho n and rho n minus one, rho n n plus one, rho n and so on and so forth. So when you add them all together, all you end up doing is canceling out the energies of each of the intermediate steps, and you get the final thing minus the initial thing, which is useful because it means that when you do this repetition process, you only need to consider the beginning point and the end point, and you will essentially be able to calculate the energy difference, which is useful. Okay, and um, well, I am already three minutes late. All I would add to complete this, so uh, thanks for the question earlier about the schematics. So I've already talked about essentially why we do this. But all of this, I would say, is a description, or the simplest description of discrete thermodynamics. And by discrete, I mean you do it sort of operation, operations, then another operation. So operation step by step, basically. And the reason I say this is because later on in the course, when we consider autonomous thermal machines, we will shift to a, a view of continuous quantum thermodynamics, where essentially the processes are happening all the time. So rather than it being, oh, I do the useful operation and then I reset my machine to what I require, we will go into a description where I actually have both of them working at the same time. So my, I will have a process that is interacting the machine with my system to take it towards a desired state, and another process that is continuously maintaining my machine in a, in a desired state, or as close to the desired state as I can, because of course these will become now competing processes and we will have to calculate the results in another manner. So all of this is now the simplest description of discrete thermodynamics. Very good. Uh, with that, I will end this lecture. I would, um, I would actually recommend that for this lecture, you do read the lecture notes from last year, because it does it in an alternate way. But because, the, um, yeah, because I switched uh, tactics of how to do it, and it was not always uh, very clear, it's probably a good idea to read the lecture notes from last year about the, about the swap and the energy change and stuff. I will continue tomorrow with the theory of passivity. Thank you. Oh, yeah, and I can answer questions, of course. Yeah.
Yes. Yes. Yes, this is absolutely right. So what you've pointed out is that when I consider the energy change to just be the average energy change and stuff, what I'm not considering is the energy required to not to do so when, when I so when I do the reset, of course the system's energy, the the, the machine's energy will change, but that comes for free because it, it's basically thermalization. But I'm not considering the energy, as you say, of like actually shifting the qubit out, bringing a new qubit in. So this is somehow all of the machinery that's required to do a discrete thermodynamics, and that energy is not considered. And this is indeed a weakness of discrete thermodynamics because then if I take n to infinity in this number of steps, I'm actually hiding out a huge amount. Well, not only of of energy, but also of just machinery. I would need so many machines, copies ready and stuff. And this is the reason why continuous thermodynamics is better, because there I just, as you say, instead of replacing the machine, I just keep the machine connected, and everything is, is nice. The, um, the reason you, we do consider discrete thermodynamics is because if, um, well, we will see that when, for example, when I want to take a qubit from an initial state to something that's very, very cold, then if I just connect it to an autonomous thermal machine, it'll take me to one particular temperature. But to get it very cold, I would either have to connect it to a very cold autonomous machine, which is very inefficient, or I would do discrete thermo. I would first connect it to a machine that was slightly colder, then another one that was even colder, then an even colder, and then it would be more efficient to do so. So this is why you, we also still need the discrete thermo to consider processes like this. But the, but the point is absolutely correct about the hidden cost. Yeah. <laughs>